Welcome to the Private Practice Startup Podcast, where we help ambitious private practitioners across the globe to brand themselves and grow their dream practices. We chat with successful private practitioners, business coaches, and marketing experts, bringing you tons of practice building ninja tips. Visit privatepracticestartup.com for awesome resources, attorney approved private practice paperwork, and our signature marketing e course. Here are your co hosts, Dr. Kate Campbell and Katie Lemieux. Hey there, Startup Nation. Welcome back to another episode of the Private Practice Startup Podcast. And we are on part two of a two-part podcast with Hannah Woody and Monica LeBlanc talking about the Enneagram. So in part one, we kind of talked about the basics of the Enneagram. They did a really brief description of the overview, the one through nine of the Enneagram. And today we're talking about the Enneagram in crisis. So part two. So really looking at the world today and everything that's going on with COVID, the continued racism across the world, especially here in America, um, as well as just really looking at personal crisis because we all go through that. And so we show up in one way, as I'm understanding, I'm not the expert here. Um, we show up as one way and then under crisis and pressure, we show up in another. So we're going to be diving into that today. So like I said, if you missed part one, go back and listen. You need the basics if this is all new to you. Um, and we're welcoming back again, Hannah and Monica. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. Um, we so appreciate you being here and being part of Startup Nation family. Um, it's funny, I would always say we're giving you a virtual hug and with COVID and everything, that just seems like the norm now. So virtual hugs to you guys. Um, And if you're joining us again, and if you're a long time listener, welcome back as well. For our first time listeners, we have a gift for you, our A to Z cheat sheet, the essentials for building and growing your dream practice. Head on over to privatepracticestartup.com, check out the resources and there you'll see it, grab it. And it also comes with several days of practice building emails. Hello, ladies again. Hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> We're back for part two. So if you if you are just tuning into part two and you missed part one, let me just share a little bit about Hannah and Monica. They're both counselors in private practice in Asheville, North Carolina, and they're both certified to teach the Enneagram and the embodiment tradition. They use the Enneagram to help themselves and others explore what barriers get in the way of people leading their most fulfilled and connected lives. Howdy. <laughs> Howdy. <laughs> let's do, let's dive in to talk about the Enneagram you and in crisis. Yeah, we started, where, where should we start on this one? <laughs> we started with type nine last time, and I think it makes sense to just work our way backwards and talking about how each type really handles themselves um, during extra times of stress or times of additional stress, like Katie was referring to in the beginning of the podcast here. Um, but be first, we, before we dive in, first, let's take a quick break from our sponsor. There are so many ways to keep your practice organized, but Therapy Notes is by far the best. Their easy-to-use, secure platform lets you not only do billing, scheduling, and progress notes, but also create a client portal to share documents and request signatures. Plus, they offer amazing unlimited phone support. So when you have a question, they're there so you, you can get help fast. Get started with Therapy Notes today, trusted by over 60,000 professionals. Go to therapynotes.com and enter promo code PPS, as in private practice startup, and you'll get two months for free. Also, you can listen to episode 54, where we interviewed Brad Pliner and took an in-depth view into their EHR. Okay, guys, it's sponsor time. You know what? Instead of reading a script about Gusto's payroll and benefits, we wanted to tell you what small business owners say, the people who use Gusto every day. Here's what one small business owner says. With Gusto, I think of payroll as a 30-second job. The website is so friendly and a joy to use. Friendly payroll? You don't hear that every day. And how about Amy from Utah? Amy says, I love Gusto so much. It's so painless. It's like going to the spa and we have great options and rates even though we're a super small team. Like going to the spa? Wow. And here's what Mneet says about Gusto's support team. Whenever something comes up, I reach out and literally 24 hours later, they tell us what to do or assure us that we've already handled it. Smart technology and friendly humans, that's super cool. Honestly, the list goes on, and right now our listeners get three months free when they go to gusto.com slash PPS. Yep, three months of payroll, benefits, administration, and more, totally free. Again, that's gusto.com slash PPS. Let's dive on in. All right. Well, nine is a, a really great number to start with. We, we almost always start with nine because um, if you look at the Enneagram symbol, nine is at the very top of the Enneagram. 
And um, something that we didn't mention in the last podcast is that nines have this incredible ability to to talk to someone and to see that person's perspective, to like really like understand where they're coming from. And then that nine can go to another person and that person can have a totally different perspective and they really relate to it. And like, Oh yeah, I, I can see where you're coming from. And yeah, I get that. Um, and so for type nines, part of this incredible ability to see all perspectives um, means that life can get, confusing and that life can get overwhelming really quick. Um, and so for nines in crisis, like, and I would definitely define 2020 as a collective global crisis. I mean, we, we are all going through so much right now and, and nines response to crisis, um, oftentimes is to numb. Um, crisis is overwhelming. It's intense. Um, I know that a lot of people right now are having feelings of fear, Um, fear for themselves, fear for what can happen to their families, fear for their health. Um, And nine's response to that overwhelming emotion um, is to try to numb it out. Um, Nines are infamous for having what we call a cozy corner um, in their homes. And it's like a an area of their homes where they have a lot of books. They might have like a tablet or like all their chargers set up there to view their phones. There's probably um, a TV right there. It's just this like uh, almost like a a media consumption corner um, that they use to kind of numb out. They use to to deal with feelings of overwhelm. Um, Also, something that I've heard a lot of nines talk about recently is that in response to you know, the response to crisis that, um, it feels like all of a sudden with the pandemic that the world got kind of quiet. Um, and that it felt for a moment, like the world was mirroring their inner life and like what they feel like all the time. And so there was, I think this bit of a, um, it felt kind of nice at first, like, oh, okay, good. I can breathe. The world is quieting down. Um, but then Obviously, you know, things, things aren't going well. There's a crisis still happening. Um, and so I, I suspect that nines are still continuing to lean into a lot of those numbing behaviors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and so type eight uh, in, in times of stress or crisis, uh, instead of numbing out the intensity of the crisis, the eight is going to kind of run right towards it. Um, I like to think about eights in crisis as like really putting themselves on the front line. So eights are really natural leaders. Um, they, they have a clear sense of direction and they really don't mind telling people what they think it is. They don't have any problems being honest about what they think the right thing to do is. Um, and they have this really strong internal sense of justice and what is, what is wrong in the world. And definitely that sense of justice is really rooted in protecting uh, populations that they perceive as um, weak or vulnerable or disenfranchised in some way. So for eights in in times of crisis, they tend to step into leadership positions and really um, get pretty gung-ho about organizing and about what can we do and how can we, um, how can we make this problem better. And while that all sounds fine and good, what, what it's really about for them is avoiding the vulnerability that it would take to really sit in the reality of what's happening. If you're focused on the solution, then you don't have to fully explore the problem. And for eights, that tends to be kind of a big crisis coping mechanism. And another thing that's important to mention about eights in crisis is the overworking. So um, eights have this particular relationship with the concept of lust, um, but just kind of like they can really handle a lot more than other people. They can handle more stress. They can handle more substance. They can hand, they can eat more. I mean, they can just, they, they're, they can just have this kind of big appetite for life. And so, um, unfortunately, because they're, they're kind of consuming or working so hard or being in this leadership position, they can also wear themselves out. And when eights get worn out, 
um, their response to that kind of overwhelm is to disappear. And so you have this person who's, you know, really okay with being out front. And then all of a sudden they kind of disappear. And for eights, uh, we call it the eight cave, but it can really look like closing all the shutters, um, like not answering the phone and really removing themselves. So uh, it, that zest for life, while feels good and better than being in the vulnerability of the problem for the moment can also really cause some hard consequences. Yeah. I I'm seeing so many eights rise to the occasion right Mm -hmm. now and like Mm -hmm. leadership roles and um, especially with, especially with the protests and with the black lives matter movement, there's just so much, there's so much uh, leadership emerging Um, and eights tend to be really natural leaders that way. And, uh, very powerful, very, very powerful. Um, so for moving on to Enneagram type seven, uh, the enthusiast or the adventurer, um, sevens, sevens do not like to feel stressed. <laughs> um, they do not like crisis. I mean, nobody likes crisis, but sevens in particular are going to feel very, very triggered around um, experiencing the, the negative emotions of fear um, and shame. And, um, and so for sevens, they, they are at first attempting to make things positive, um, attempting to lean into optimism and, um, leaning into the bright side. Um, sevens might actually be literally trying to run away from, from problems or run away from what, what is breaking them out right now. So sevens naturally are a type that travels a lot. They're known for just jumping on planes and going places and, um, in pursuit of fun. And, um, while it is fun for them, it also can be a function for them to avoid themselves and to avoid negativity and avoiding those darker, um, parts of themselves because they're scared they're going to get trapped there. So with my goodness, with quarantine, um, where we are, so many of us are actually trapped in our homes, we're staying home. Um, that has been very, very difficult for a lot of sevens because they can't, they can't run away from things. They can't get up and go. They can't use their normal coping mechanisms. Um, and so, so for sevens, um, something else that can happen with them under stress is that this person who's really fun loving and really bouncy and energetic and positive all of a sudden can get kind of serious and bossy um, where they, they get kind of um, they, they, it's like, I need to get serious. So we're all going to get serious now. And then they can get uh, a bit of a judgmental flair can come up about how other people are doing things, how systems are working. Um, but also they, they can experience more criticism of themselves in those moments too. So stress really does have a pretty profound impact um, on the way that a seven shows up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So listen, if you are in the zombie apocalypse, I hope that you have a type (laughs) six on your island because (laughs) like sixes are awesome at crisis. The crisis is where sixes shine. So part of their natural personality, their like natural inclination is to always be preparing for things to go wrong. So sixes, especially in like what's happening right now are probably the folks sitting at home being like, I knew it. I knew it. I knew this was coming. And they, and they, and they do, they have these like really big, beautiful intuitions, but they also tend to be really great in a crisis. Um, they tend to kind of know exactly what to do. They maintain their composure because their natural way of being is crisis esque, right? Um, so when a, when actual crisis happens, they they're cool, calm, and collected. Sixes are tend to be really great in crisis for other people, but for themselves, the anxiety that crisis brings up gets amplified. And then there's this kind of um, hyper focus on something, something to something to do about it. So it could be that they, um, you know, get super focused on their health and their body, and they're maybe they're working out more. They're getting really rigid about their meal prep, or they're 
checking their blood pressure and their temperature a lot, but there's this kind of hyper focusing on something to do about it while also experiencing um, paralyzing levels of anxiety um, kind of underneath the surface. But as far as like being in a crisis with other people, sixes are so great to have around because they are, they're always planning and scanning for chaos. So when it happens, they know exactly what to do. Yeah. Yeah. And it's kind of ironic too, because, um, sixes often don't think that they're good in a crisis. Like they're planning so much and they're scared of a crisis. Um, and, but once, you know, once they're in it, everyone else around them is like, okay, this is the grounded person. This is the person that knows what they're doing. But the six doesn't feel like that internally. They're, they're freaking out internally. And so, um, when, when in crisis, the crisis is real and it's happening. Um, but sixes right now, I think are legit experiencing a lot of anxiety and a lot of, um, okay, it's happening. What do we do? And it's not a short crisis. This is ongoing. Um, if everything is, has, is ongoing, we don't know when, when it's going to end. And so I think sixes are experiencing a substantial amount of stress right now. So for, for type five, um, how, fives might be showing up in this crisis. Um, you know, even, even though fives are like, so five is called the observer or the investigator. And re- the reason they're called the observer is because they're sort of looking out into life and into society and they are observing it um, almost in place of actively being involved in it. Um, and because of that, they often do have a lot of very, profound observations about humans and about society and what's happening. And so um, fives are, are simultaneously feeling scared and feeling um, stress about what's happening. And I'm also seeing a lot of them actively offering wisdom or offering observations to the rest of us about what's happening, whether it's focusing on health and the pandemic or it's focusing on um, the protests and sort of the systemic, um, you know, systemic reasons why this is happening right now. And um, so fives, fives, if they're able to do that, it's taking a lot of energy from them to do that. It takes a lot of energy to show up. And so fives are also a type that um, is going to be going kind of into their homes, into their, you know, into their areas where they feel secure and safe um, and going to be spending a lot more time there or feeling like they need a lot more um, time alone by themselves to just jump up into their intellect and spend time there feeling safe. Um, it's a bit of a conundrum because while they need that, also stepping out into society and stepping out into connection with other humans um, ultimately is what they need to do to create a sense of safety for themselves. Um, and it, it's sort of the, that's the exact opposite of what their fixation is telling them to do. Um, and I think one more important thing about fives right now is that um, a lot of people assume that because they tend to be more introverted and homebody type people that they're really uh, at their flow or they're really enjoying kind of quarantine life. Um, they might be, but also um, fives like really like their structure and their, their kind of schedule and kind of keeping things normal. And um, a lot of that has been taken away and um, I think fives are experiencing um, the stress of disconnection and the stress of uh, a world that is experiencing chaos and um, feeling like there's not really a whole lot that they can do about it or really questioning what it is that they can do about it. Mm. I get that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 The, what do I do? Um, okay. Type four. So for type four, um, type four is are unique because they love to be unique. So type fours, uh, something that's important to note about them is that they really work hard, maybe not consciously, but work hard to be unique. They like to look different than other people. They like to think differently than other people. They really relish in having kind of a different perspective. And because they're always kind of scanning for how they are different, it leads them into a trap of comparison. And so this trap of comparison can kind of create this inner monologue of, 
am I better than this or am I not as good at this? So this can get kind of, um, this, this inner narrative can amplify in times of crisis where fours are really sitting with their own pain. And as Hannah likes to say, licking their own wounds, um, and really isolating themselves. Fours are great at Fours are great at spending time by themselves. They have big imaginations. They can really occupy um, their time with, you know, journaling or painting or sitting on the porch or gardening or, or whatever it is. And they're really good at that. But um, the, the problem with the isolation is that it makes that comparison narrative worse because you're kind of looking out into the world, but you're not sit connecting with other people to kind of normalize your experience, which means that you're always kind of measuring yourself up against other people in the world. So um, especially right now, fours may be kind of, uh, and in times of crisis, tend to sink into the depression or the pain or the agony of what's happening and kind of live there. Um, and, and use that, that comparison and that isolation as ways to not get out of that. Um, and that can be really, really hard for fours. And I'm, and I'm hearing that from fours right now that, um, you know, they're, they're working on ways to kind of connect with other people, but that there's a part of them that's really comfortable in melancholy or in the pain of the world. And that, that feels almost like a home space for them. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So lots of, lots of absorbing of the emotional ten- intensity. Some types mm-hmm. avoid it and some types push it out. Fours absorb, they absorb all the emotions of it. Um, so for, for type three, um, they're trying to avoid a lot of the, the emotions, or at least the negative emotions of what's happening right now. Um, and three is the achiever. Um, and threes, threes often, it's like their response to stress of any kind, um, response to feelings of not being worthy, uh, response to, um, crisis is I have to work harder and I have to do better. And so for threes, there's, they're often like right now they have amped up their productivity or they've amped up their content creation or whatever it is that they do, um, as a way to kind of, uh, deal with the anxiety that's coming up in crisis. Um, and, and so threes end up, um, like crisis essentially amplifies our fixation. It, it sort of, um, the need to lean on the coping mechanism of our personality gets stronger. And so a lot of times in crisis, you see the, um, you see kind of the most, almost like the most negative traits or the most stuck traits of the types um, start to emerge in a really strong way. Um, and I think three is a really good, a really good example of that, of like they start to stress and work even harder. Um, and the problem with that for threes is that they can get cut off from their emotions. They can get cut off from what's really important to them. And so uh, a three might experience like, wow, I'm scared for my family. I'm scared. I'm scared of what's happening right now. Um, And then they dive into work as a way to try to deal with that anxiety, which can ultimately cut them off from the very thing that, that, that prompted the anxiety in the first place, the thing that they're trying to protect. And so, um, yeah, so for threes in crisis, we're seeing a lot more productivity and a lot more working um, and sort of a an anxiety about the intense level of feelings that are happening and trying to grapple with that. Yeah. Also the like pivoting of like what, (laughs) what their productivity looks like, right? Like, so a three that goes to an office every day might be really working super hard to create some kind of new online business or learning how to become the best flute player that there ever was. Right. So kind of this, this pivoting to figuring out how do I get my, how do I get those productivity needs met with three? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, For type two. So like Hannah was saying, and thank you for, thank you for that point, Hannah, around the like, yeah, it tightens, it tightens the fixation. It makes it so that we're leaning on um, these traits even heavier in times of crisis. So for type two, that's going to look like even more helping, um, even more doing. So really, uh, 
cutting off from themselves and their own needs and even their own emotional experience of what's happening and focusing on other people's. So really looking at their, you know, their friends, their partner, their kids, and really just over focusing on those people's emotional experience of the crisis instead of really sitting with, wow, this is really making me sad. Wow. I'm really upset. I'm really angry. I'm really feeling tired and overwhelmed and exhausted and confused. So instead of really sitting with their own emotions, really looking at other people's and um, working to take care of other people's stuff. So, so because twos really struggle to be in contact with their own needs um, and, and not just be in contact with them, but also then ask for them, sometimes they get their needs and project their needs onto other people. And so a concrete example of what that might look like is if I'm feeling thirsty, I might offer you some water, right? And I'm, or I might not even offer, I would probably actually just get you some water and set it down in front of you and not even realize that I'm the one that's thirsty. So for type two, we're really um, seeing a lot of like, just not being aware of what they need and really focusing on the needs of others and kind of um, this quality of self self abnegation where maybe they're not uh, maintaining proper social distance or maybe they're really struggling to wear masks. Uh, twos also have this uh, tend to have pretty expressive faces. So the mask thing would be pretty difficult for a two. Um, but also just the, the struggling to socialize in new ways, because if you get your worth from being in a particular kind of connection, then it would be really difficult to not have that source of, of worth that you're normally used to relying on. Yeah, that's super hard for twos right now. Like they, they're getting their sense of worth and connection through other people when that, that uh, highway essentially is cut off. Um, then, then it leaves them to grapple with their stuff and mm-hmm. leaves them grappling with that feeling of uh, shame and not being worthy. So another, another type, some types are, are having a particularly hard time in this crisis. And I think you know, threes are one of them, twos are one of them, sevens. Uh-huh. Um, so for, for Enneagram type one um, called the, the perfectionist or the reformer, um, I think for them in, in times of crisis, it, there's nothing like a crisis to reveal the flaws in a system. <laughs> um, and and ones, ones are already very naturally sort of searching for those flaws and inconsistencies and what isn't right. And when a crisis happens, it's like blowing it up. And, and for ones, it could be an experience of like, well, I told you so. Or like, well, yes, because this is what we've been doing wrong this whole time. Um, and so for ones, I think that internally, they're experiencing a ton of frustration, uh, maybe even full-blown anger, hopefully, because um, ones kind of try to repress their anger and they try to kind of keep it down and keep it controlled. Um, that's where a lot of the annoyance and the frustration comes from. Um, but for ones, they're, they're, they're looking out into the world and feeling very upset and frustrated about what's going on. And that doesn't necessarily mean that like, I mean, they could be, take the, you know, the shutdown for an example, a one could be really focusing on, it's not right that we open back up because people are going to get sick and we're sacrificing people. Like that's not right. We can't do that. Or the one's perspective could be, it's not right that people aren't working. People need to have livelihoods for themselves. This isn't right. And so they have this very, very strong moralistic sense of right and wrong. But once again, um, it's the one's own values and what the one views as right and wrong. It's not like a universal truth or, you know, what you think is right. Um, so ones are experiencing a lot of, a lot of stress from that. Um, and and it's difficult to be able to see so clearly um, what what is going wrong with things and what you know where the flaws are and what's not right. But ones are also they're called the reformer. They also um, tend to be incredibly powerful leaders that that um, that can stand their ground when no one else can. You know, they're the people that can show up and say, "I'm going to continue to fight for what I believe is right, no matter what." Um, and because of that, they end up 
a lot of times being incredibly powerful leaders that can create a lot of change and help the rest of us see where all the flaws are. So Mm -hmm. we so need that one medicine right now. Yeah. 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 Well, you ladies have been a, a joy to listen to. I know um, in between the two podcasts I had shared, I've never never been so quiet on a podcast. I've never taken so many notes. So I hope all of our listeners are doing that as well. So as we talk about the Enneagram UN in crisis, what do you hope that our listeners take away from this message? Um, I, I think I hope that they, they take away that this is hard for all of us and that um, that however you are reacting to to this crisis or to any crisis for that matter is um, a result of like it's part of your your personality and part of your enneagram fixation and um, I don't think that's anything to be ashamed about but it is something to be aware of and something that you can practice active observation of um, as a way to make choices for yourself that really are in your best interest and really are serving you and your highest self and aren't making decisions that are based in fear or that are based in shame. Um, Yeah. That's what I hope people take away. Awesome. Thanks, Hannah. What about you, Monica? Yeah. I, I hope that people um, just take away that. uh, Yeah. I love the piece. I, I would echo a lot of Hannah's sentiments about the active observer, right? That we can't change what we don't know about. And the Enneagram really gives us such a clear picture of the things that get in the way of us having the life that we want to have. Um, so the clearer picture we have, the more we can look out for it. Nice. Thank you, ladies, so much. And I know that you had referenced two books previously, and people can get in touch with you and even work with you or do your courses through the Empowered Enneagram. And just share the two books that you mentioned before as well. Uh, that was The Complete Enneagram by Beatrice Chestnut and The Wisdom of the Enneagram by uh, Don Rousseau and Russ Hudson. Awesome. Thank you again for being here with us and sharing this information and information. We really hope that you guys enjoyed this podcast. Yeah. And, if, you and guys. If, anybody, if anybody wants to learn more about the Enneagram, um, we have a podcast um, that, that goes over in more detail all of the types. So that's Empowered Enneagram. Um, so you can get a lot more information there if you're interested. This was fantastic, ladies. Thank you so much for coming on for this two-part series. And Startup Nation, we really hope you enjoyed these episodes. And as always, we encourage you to subscribe, rate, and review the show. Uh, Share with your friends and fellow colleagues. Help us get the word out so we can really help support more practitioners from Startup to Mastery. And if there's a particular episode that you haven't heard yet that you want to hear, let us know. If you're loving episodes, let us know that too. We always love hearing from you guys when we get those random emails in our inbox that it definitely makes our day. So um, we look forward to seeing you on the next episode and continuing to inspire you from Startup to Mastery. Take care, everybody. Thanks for joining us on The Private Practice Startup. Visit theprivatepracticestartup.com for awesome resources, free trainings, attorney-approved private practice paperwork, and so much more. 